Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 66 of I Wish You Were Dead, a podcast about things that used to be alive. My name is Mike, and that is Gavin. Gavin, I'm feeling a little bit lonely today. Why? Well, oh, had, oh, yeah, we know, don't have a guest. You're right. <laughs> right. We've had guests the last couple episodes. We, uh, you know, we have an addition coming down the pipeline that, uh, you know, we'll just hint at right now. But as of right now, it's just you and me. And, uh, you know, it's both warm and familiar, but also a little <laughs> bit lonely. Uh, but, you know, that's that's how it started. <laughs> you know, that's, that's what we're used to. You never we're, forget we're your first. Exactly. You never forget your, your roots. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> anywho, today we're going to be talking about what I had always kind of learned as a pretty like just kind of nothing period of geologic history, uh, which is the Silurian period. We're sort of on a track to talk about or have a dedicated episode to every, uh, you know, geologic period or, you know, as we get a little sooner. A little more recent, we'll probably slice that up a little more than than periods. But uh, yeah, the Silurian period, I had always learned, it's, it's sort of one that you brush over for reasons that we'll talk about. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. But before we get to that, Mike, what happened today in history? I mean, before we even get there, I just want to say that like this episode already sounds way more boring than the last couple we did with our special guests. So. Right. And, and I thought so too, going into it, I was like, uh, oh, I guess you gotta I do guess everything. We'll do like, a, this, a, this one falls in the category of just you gotta do it, right? But you know, as I as I did more, I was like, okay, no, there were some there was some cool stuff that happened during this time. It's just not necessarily something you'd spend like a whole lot of time on in a geology class. Um, Fair enough. So, but that's why this podcast is here. Fair enough. Well, uh, regardless, still thank you to all of our guests. As far as today in history goes, so March sixteenth in history. Um, I don't exactly know what this means other than it involves space stuff and like there's nothing cooler than space. I'm sorry. That's true. No, I agree. We've discussed this before. Yeah. Um, in 1966, Gemini 8 launched with Neil Armstrong and David R. Scott aboard and it conducted the first docking of two spacecraft in orbit. A flight was aborted after a critical system failure with the crew um, returned safely to Earth. So... Um, you know, Gemini eight, there was a critical failure. That's not good, but there was Neil Armstrong and that's amazing. Exactly. And so, so what year was yeah. that again? 1966. So we are right. three years pre moon landing. Right. And so, I mean, that, that was important because, you know, like I said, the first time that like two, you know, well, if they had an, a, a critical failure, I, I don't know if the failure happened before or after they were able to dock the, the Yeah, spacecraft. this doesn't quite say. The way it makes it sound... The way it was phrased kind of makes it seem like it was after. Yeah, I'm trying to, I don't know, trying to do some quick wikipedia But I know, like, um, the Gemini were sort of like the lead up to the Apollo missions. So this looks like it was actually um, while they were on board, because according to the Wikipedia article, um, it suffered the first critical in-space system failure of a U.S. spacecraft that threatened the lives of the astronauts and required an immediate abort of the mission. Okay. So I guess the crew was on board while there was, you know, a critical failure. And, uh, you know, we almost lost Neil. I mean, imagine if we spent this whole time learning about, you know, some other, if we learned, you know, Buzz Aldrin was the first person in space or on the moon. Maybe, like, maybe that third guy whose name we all forget, even though we really should know it. Um, 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 um are you referring to Michael Collins? I sure am. Uh, maybe How we would you? actually How know. His name. So yeah, if you're not aware, so Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin are the ones whose names we all know. Cause they were the first two people to walk on the moon, but there was a third person who had to sit in the, the lunar lander who did not get to step on the moon. His name was Michael and Collins. Just, or, just orbited the moon the whole time. Right. Well, no, he was on the lander. Then, I believe. Was he? I thought he was orbiting. The, oh, now I got it. I, I want to say he was that he was on the lander. I might be wrong. But well, now let's find out. Yeah. See, all right. You know what's rough here is I look up Michael Collins on Wikipedia, and it brings me to like that page where it just lists all of the Michael Collins. It doesn't even bring <laughs> me right to the Michael Collins. Like, yeah, Michael Collins, Michael Collins. Oh man, this, this is rough stuff. All right. So, um, all right. You keep talking about stuff. I'll figure sure. out what Michael Collins um, is doing. But yeah, so the Gemini missions were pretty much just sort of a lot of the prep work that needed to be done before the full scale Apollo 11 mission that made that got to the moon. Um, and so 
I'm, you know, surprised that there was, because that said it was the first critical failure of a mission, at least of, of like the US stuff, which really kind of surprises me considering how bad technology kind of was in the fifties when we started, it said it was the first things. one that threatened the lives of astronauts. Um, gotcha. So like, okay. I think there was other failures, but this was the first one where it was like, Oh, where it was oh, like, where it was like bad. a man ship that had a failure that, okay. Right. That, like that this makes was, sense. Right. This wouldn't have been a turn back then, but like, you know, that could have went McAuliffe if, uh, if things went bad. <laughs> um, yeah. What, what do we got? On, at that. I thought, I would, what do we got on Michael Collins? You, um, it looks like he stayed in orbit around the moon as best oh, as okay. I can tell All right. from Wikipedia. But still, you know, being that close to being on the moon, and it's like maybe if, if this mission had gone awry, uh, Michael Collins would have been the person on the moon. But he, he may have been. I always just love thinking about how, um, and it's creepy to think about how Michael Collins was as far away from any human being as any human being has ever been. Yeah. And being on the other side of the moon, the next two closest human beings were literally the moon away. And mm-hmm. then everybody else was obviously, you know, yeah. You know, however the distance between the, uh, the earth and the moon. So it's just, you know, the, the thoughts that must've gone through your head at that point. Well, with those, you know, those creepy thoughts aside, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's... continuing on to, uh, you know, super exciting episode on the Silurian uh, period, right? Yeah, absolutely. And like I said, Silurian Slytherin, something like that. So depending on, who, what side of the pond you live on. It's either Silurian or Silurian. Um, but so this is the third period of the Phanerozoic Eon that we are still currently in. So the first period was the Cambrian. Uh, the second period was the Ordovician, which we talked about in episode 59. And then after that comes the Silurian. So the Silurian is unique for a couple of reasons number one it is really short it is only uh you know less than 30 million years in length which especially for as compared to the other time periods we talked about which are about how long right so uh the ordovician period which came before it was around 42 million years and mm-hmm. the devonian period that comes after the solarian was around 60 Hmm. So, compared to so it's short, but it's not like super short. It sounds like no, but it's like the the it is not the shortest. Uh, the shortest one, well, is the one that we are currently in because that's only been around two and a half million years. But if you're excluding that, uh, it's this one is the second shortest by a couple million years, but not too many. So it's still okay. right in there with the shortest ones, especially because you get into like the Cretaceous period was quite long. Um, up in the, you know, over 60, you know, million years. So relatively short, which just inherently means that we have less rocks from this time. Gotcha. Um, which means we have less information about this time, just inherently. And also with it being so old, you know, the older the rocks are, uh, you know, the, the less of a chance that we still have rocks from this time that they haven't been eroded away or, uh, you know, buried or... Uh, subducted down into the earth or something. So th- it's a short period. So there's not a lot of rocks to begin with and it's old. So there's probably not all that many rocks left, which I think is a big part of the reason why it's not discussed as heavily as a lot of the other periods. So this sounds less like it's actually boring and more just like, we just don't know that much about it. I think that that is a decent part of it. We definitely do know things, which, which I'll get into, but um, yeah, it's just not, well positioned for us to know a lot of things about plus nothing like big and you know lucrative really happened during this time you know there's no big mass extinction um there's no big like radiation event like there was in the cambrian period there wasn't really anything on land yet but we'll we'll talk about that but um there were no vertebrates for sure on land so it's not even like you can just talk about the cool dinosaurs or something um <laughs> So there's just less to talk about. That doesn't mean that there's not important things to talk about. So, uh, like I said, this, the and a big thing, a big piece of context to keep in mind for this entire episode is that the Silurian period takes place right after the first of the big five, quote unquote, mass extinctions uh, at the end of the Ordovician period. So we are in a, in a world recovering from the first big mass extinction that life on earth has experienced to this point. So that is some really important context to keep in mind. (laughs) 
But what did the world look like around this time? Uh, so if you remember back to episode 59, if you uh, listen to it about the Ordovician period, uh, it was a very different looking planet than we have today. Uh, you know, most of the land today is in the Northern Hemisphere, but there's still a decent amount of land in the Southern Hemisphere. You know, you've got South America. Shout out to all of our Australian listeners. Yeah, we actually do have a, uh, a number, a, a non-zero number of, of Aussie <laughs> listeners. So shout outs to you. Um, top of the morning to you. That's the wrong island colonized by the British. Uh, so you got me with that one. That was um, good. But yeah, so it's like yes, yeah, yes, there is more land in, in the northern hemisphere, but there is still continents in the south. You know, South America, Australia, Antarctica, you know, Africa. Well, parts of Africa and lots of islands and, and things like that. Uh, at this time, it was reversed. So all the continents were instead down toward the South Pole, or at least along the equator. And the North uh, Northern Hemisphere was basically all ocean. Uh, and so it was sort of reversed, but to a much, much higher degree. So there were really no major continents to speak of that far north of the equator. And so the big continent that we have at this time is called Gondwana. This is one of the big deal supercontinents in Earth history. And it, you have mentioned this before. Yeah. And so this is a continent that keeps coming up because it formed, uh, I think, around depending on which exact sources you look at, at least 600 and some odd 100 million years ago and lasted until after Pangaea broke up. So, you know, it lasted up until, you know, 80 to 60 ish million years ago. I don't, those dates are a little fuzzy, but you know, lasted easily over 500 million years, these continents being together. And so Gondwana is made up of basically what is today our Southern continents, South America, Africa, uh, Australia, uh, India was down there at the time and Antarctica. And so big, big, big chunk of land. And that was situated a bit South of the equator and would continue to sort of move more south as the period went on, uh, sort of continuing the trend that sort of happened uh, during the Ordovician period um, that helped cause that extinction. And so, while most of the land was down in the south, some continents did exist up in the north. There were some continents that we don't have today. You can find evidence of them, but they don't exist like we think of continents today. So up there, it was mostly the continent of Baltica, which is now uh, northern Europe, like uh, Sweden, Finland area. Avalonia, which has since been accreted, uh, which is basically like fu what does that mean? fused to what is now North America. Why can't they just say fused? Accreted? Yes, that is that is the technical term. Is there a like, quick side note? I have the same yeah. problem with lawyers. I, I have a very long standing <laughs> feud with lawyers and it's not just because my sister became a lawyer. I've had a feud with lawyers for a while. Sure. What? Why all the fancy names for stuff that doesn't need fancy names? Accreted. You know, it's like cease and desist. You like just have, call it like a stop letter. So you know, why, it why is, can't we just say the, the thing fused? Because that's not descriptive enough. Because this is a particular kind of like permanent, you know, for lack of a better term, fusion. Uh, so I don't know. I didn't create the term. You'll, you'll have to take that up with a, a structural geologist. This, this is a topic for another time, but I know in the legal community, this is, this is like an ongoing movement to make language more accessible. And so I, oh, I yeah, have no, a conversation I agree. just about scientific language at some point on here, but story for another time. Sorry for the, uh, for the derailment. No, absolutely. I think that's a good point. Cause you know, science does get very jargony and that's a big part of why you're here because I, I don't even question. <laughs> that 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 accreted is is the verb to use there uh mm -hmm. yeah that you know that is part of my job here is just to be like what 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 are we doing here exactly uh but yeah so we had baltica which is now northern europe avalonia which is now part of the like northern east coast of north america and laurentia which is now parts of europe and north america that has since sort of split from what it used to be um, so all of those started to collide into each other to form another supercontinent 
called Your America. I think that is more of a term that is used uh, in other parts of the world. I have always learned it as Laurasia. Lora- so Your America and Laurasia sound like they're same two thing. different things. Yeah, they sound like they should be, but they're the same. Hmm. But basically, by the end of the Silurian period, we definitely have Gondwana as one supercontinent down the south, and then the very solid, so- solidly into the process of forming the northern supercontinent of Laurasia. Those two pieces okay. would then come together to form Pangaea a little bit later. Gotcha. So Pangaea is coming up. We have not yet. It's not like uh, Pangaea started to break up. We are still waiting for Pangaea at this point. Right. Pangaea is very much, you know, it's not even a little twinkle in the eye of Earth at this point. <laughs> and so uh, some other things about the world is that generally there was not a lot of like really high mountains at this time, mostly because we, we all of like the big evidences that we have of mountain ranges don't date to the right time mountains are really convenient in that when they form they do a lot of weird chemical things which means we can date them uh quite easily um so even things like the like the uh appalachians these days uh they're not all that tall they used to be real tall uh like himalaya size tall uh but we and we can tell that because of how much sediment you, you can sort of chemically trace back to them from this time. Just, you know, sediment eroding into, you know, what is like the central part of North America off of those mountains. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we don't find any sign of big mountain ranges like that dating back to this time period. So it seems like it was a relatively stable period in terms of continents colliding into each other, mostly because like Gondwana was already together. So it sort of moved as a one big block. I'm sure there was some mountain building that was going on, you know, 25 million years or so is, you know, it it is a long time, but, uh, Mm -hmm. I'm I'm sure that's probably chalked up a little bit to how short this period is because (laughs) yeah, mountains do take a while to form, but this is such a small window. That's like, we might just be missing a lot of the big mountain building events. So, uh, really low elevations right. in general, and generally warm, quite a bit warm, and lots of CO2 compared to today, like around 10 times the CO2, atmospheric CO2 that we have today. Um, so it was, it was warm, and because there was low elevation and high sea levels, because it was so warm, uh, there was lots of epicontinental seas, which is basically a, a sea that instead of being on top of ocean crust, like you think of with the Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, it's on top of continental crust. So it is basically a flooded continent. Um, a flooded co- Okay. So Because you've mentioned this before, actually, because I've, I've had that question, like, what's the mm-hmm. difference between, like, you know, crust in the ocean and crust on land? And you've said, you know, you've mentioned there is an actual difference between yeah. those two. So this is sort of a an unnatural blending of those, where a crust that's supposed to be land, supposed to be dry, has water all over it. Well, it's not that it's supposed to be. That's but wrong term, but in right, general, we but, think of it as, you know, as land as opposed to water. Right. Yeah. So basically, so there's very roughly oceans have basalt as their crust. It's much thinner and much farther down. Uh, mm-hmm. Whereas continents have granite as their crust, which is uh, much thicker, much higher up and also less dense. Um, so typically, you know, if a, continental plate meets an oceanic plate because the con- the oceanic crust is more dense it will sink underneath the continent that's what's happening on the west coast of north america and south america right now um but anyway so yeah so this is uh and for for some modern examples that you might be able to at least sort of picture in your mind uh of epicontinental seas so the persian gulf uh, between Saudi Arabia and the rest of uh, like Asia proper. So on the eastern side of uh, the Arabian Peninsula, that is an epicontinental sea, as well as Hudson Bay up in Canada. That is an epicontinental sea. Both of those have, uh, you know, a granite underneath them instead of ocean. If mm-hmm. that makes sense. Right. 
So all of that kind of C was very common. And these are generally really good, really productive oceanic environments because it's, you know, the bottom of that ocean is relatively shallow. In a lot of cases, sunlight can still get to the bottom, which is a big deal, uh, which means basically that where this happens, it's essentially like the Caribbean, where it's like really clear waters, really shallow. So you get lots of things like reefs and lots of really productive environments like that. So lots of big marine life during this time, it sounds like. Right. Okay. So that is what's generally going on with the Earth itself. So then, since this is a paleontology, broadly, podcast, let's talk about some of the life that was living there. And so for the first time in this sort of little sub-series that we have talking about the history of, of the planet, we actually have something to talk about with life on land. Because in the Cambrian, there's some very, very weak evidence of some things on land. In the Ordovician, we have some non-vascular plants, things like mosses on land, probably, as well as just a few hints of maybe some arthropods being on land. Arthropods being things like your crustaceans, your you know your crabs, lobsters, and and also things like insects are arthropods. So we don't have any mammals running around yet. Oh no, absolutely not. Um, at this point, we do not have even any vertebrates on land. So not even like the very first fishy ancestors coming up on land yet. That would not happen uh, at this point for at least another forty million years or so after this period okay. ends. So. So, on land, we have plants, and I'm going to talk about them first because we we almost never talk about plants on this podcast because plants scare me. <laughs> I don't understand You have mentioned them. that, but there's a couple things that scare you. I believe plants that you've mentioned is one of them. Plants scare me the most. Um, so, I would love to have a paleobotanist come on at some point to explain plants to me just because I understand almost nothing about their biology like yeah i learned how photosynthesis works in college you know i learned how they're different than animals but plants just do a lot of weird things that even like even the weird animals are like how did you do that like plants will just randomly duplicate their genome sometimes so it's like humans have like 46 chromosomes so sometimes plants will just randomly have a baby or even just in the individual, double their genome to then have uh, 92 chromosomes and then be able to reproduce like that and then have babies with 96 chromosomes. And that's totally fine. That baby will survive and do absolutely fine and, and be great. But then all of its babies will have extra extra genes and things like that. That uh, just seems wrong. Right? That's just not a correct thing to do. And so that's can they, the... Can they keep going from there? Can they go from 96 all like all the way on up? As far as I know. Wow, that, hmm. like i said i don't understand them so that might not be entirely accurate but as far as i know that is a correct statement um and we're just going to leave my fear of plants at that point but 10 4 but plants come up on land for the first time period in the middle to late ordovician period so a little before this so that would be like i said things like your mosses things that don't really hold themselves up so mosses don't have a vascular system. They don't have a system to transport things from one part of the plant to another. They just sort of sit, and that's why you can really only find mosses in pretty damp environments. Because they also need water to reproduce. Um, they don't make seeds like you think of in most plants. Um, they use, like, spores, and the spores can really only travel through water. So... Those have been kicking on land for, you know, a few dozen million years at this point. But vascular plants show up in the middle to late Silurian period, so around this time. The most famous is a plant called Cooksonia, which looks really strange. Uh, it doesn't really have any leaves or anything, um, but it, it kind of looks like a series of, like, branching tubes. And, like, each tube, like, stem basically, has sort of like a funnel at the end of it that was effectively what it used as a leaf. 
So a very a sp- funnel as a leaf. Yeah, it was just a funnel shaped thing. Um, that is probably and this is how it got in like sunlight and everything. So I, likely the entire you know organism was green and was doing photosynthesis across its entire body. But mm-hmm. this is probably where it had it. So the the funnel shaped things were similar to a flower. These were not flowering plants, but the, I I think it's hypothesized that that is where it had its like reproductive stuff going on. Mm-hmm. Um, but that okay. is the most famous one because it is it is very obviously a vascular plant. So an example of a plant like this today would be things like ferns, where it's like they're not woody. They're very primitive sort of where it's like, it's a plant that holds itself up off the ground. It's not like a moss. It can move water from, you know, the roots up to the leaves and things, but it doesn't make seeds. It still uses spores to reproduce. It still also needs, you know, a fairly, you know, damp environment to be able to reproduce and and just function. Um, But it can actually hold itself up off the ground, which was a big thing. So there was like, whole forests of these things and by forest i mean like six to ten inches off the ground um all along you know rivers and things that existed back at this time so that was pretty much the extent of plant life and then also by this point we have some of the first animals coming up onto land and showing like actual you know real adaptations for being on land not just oh this thing are these the arthropods you were talking about? Yes. Okay. So this would be mostly, so insects would not be a thing for quite a while after this. Um, but things like myriapods, which are your millipedes and centipedes, their ancient relatives were some of the first ones to come up on land, as well as some arachnoids. So spiders and relatives, not quite true spiders yet, but uh, they were also the first things to come on land. And something interesting that I saw was that all of them from around this time appear to be carnivorous. So that kind of implies that there are some herbivorous things that we just don't have yet. That we just haven't found. Wait, so what do you, so are, are, let me see if I understand this. We indirectly think there are some herbivorous things on land, but we just haven't found them yet or haven't found the evidence of them. Is that correct? Right. And that's, Again, okay. that's ju- just based on like simple ecology where it's like, I mean, simple they, they can't all, simple. they can't all be eating each other. There's gotta be something <laughs> to be getting the nutrients from somewhere to begin with. Okay. That sounds you know? more like a thought exercise than anything. Well, it's like, you know, animals don't create, you know, sugar, which is what plants make when they do photosynthesis. No animals right. really do that themselves. And so it's like sugar or energy, you know, uh, if there's no animals can't do that. So the animals that these carnivorous things were eating must be getting it from somewhere. So presumably there were some, you know, terrestrial uh, herbivorous things eating all these little plants or potentially some kind of, you know, semi aquatic thing that would come up on land that the often enough for these terrestrial things to eat. Mm -hmm. So, Okay, so that I mean, so there's, you know, there's enough reason to believe that there was some of that going on. So why haven't we found any evidence of it? It could just be a thing of, uh, as I'll talk about a little later, the best Silurian rocks are marine, which just I think inherently makes sense. A, there's a lot more water at this time, right? And B, marine environments tend to preserve much, much better than terrestrial environments, as we've sort of talked about before. It's like you know, oceans are basins. So that's where all the sediment goes when it gets washed down a river. And in order for something to be fossilized, it needs to be buried. So it's it's kind of hard to bury something on land. It happens just quite rarely. Um, so in general, the fossil record of the Silurian is not as rich as some other periods, but the terrestrial record for sure is not awesome. Hmm. And that probably contributes to just the the general perception. This is just not a uh, like like not an exciting time period or anything going on. Just we just don't have the we don't have the primary sources, the fossils, the right. you know, anything else. Right. Although, just what this sort of infers is that you know 
even, you know, 420 or so million years ago, there were complex <laughs> nice. ecosystems. I, that was completely unintentional. Um, 421 okay. million years ago, uh, there were... <laughs> uh, you can't do that to me. <laughs> but there were, there were complex ecosystems on land. Which is crazy. That long ago, we had things on land. Um, that's all we're going to talk about for the for, uh, for land things for the rest of this episode because most of the stuff we know about is in the ocean at this point. But this is when life as we know it on land really started becoming a thing. Well, wow. okay. So we have that down. What next? So getting into all of those nice epicontinental seas, we have the first Osteichthians. Uh, which evolve, which are your bony fish. You know, things, if you are thinking of a fish, it is in this group. Uh, And funnily enough, that is also the group that we eventually evolved from once our ancestors decided to crawl up out of the ocean. So we had the first osteichthians, the first bony fish, as well as uh, the first placoderms, who are thought to be, that this changes a lot, but currently thought to be the ancestors of these bony fish. If you don't know what a placoderm is, look up Dunkleosteus. Dunkleosteus. Uh, yes. So they are oh, nice. basically a shark-shaped fish, but I guess from the head down to or about the front fins was just covered in bony armor. Of, of like armored, That's a great sight, armored plates. Just imagining that. Yeah. And so super, super cool group of animals. And it, like I said, it's thought that bony fish, the, the majority of fish that we have today evolved from a member of this group. The, you know, the fossils of this group are really good, but really confusing. So we don't know for sure. Um, but from these placoderms, our ancestors likely first, you know, evolved from and started shedding some of that armor. Um, During this time, also, if you remember back to uh, the Sharks episode in episode 31, we mentioned a group of animals called the Acanthodians. You'll probably hear them more commonly referred to as the Spiny Sharks, if you look up stuff online. But very shark-like, but were the much more common type of fishy thing around at this time. Uh, But there were also still a decent number of jawless fish, so... All of the all those other things that I mentioned, the bony fish, the placoderms, the acanthodians, those all had jaws, like you think of in a fish. Um, but that wasn't always the case. It, they had to get jaws from somewhere. And so the branch that became that that developed jaws also had a lot of, you know, cousins that did not develop jaws. And they were all still kicking around at this time as well. This this would be things similar to like your hagfish. Or uh, different kinds of lampreys. Those are jawless fishes. Um, And so doing lots of various things. Mostly predators, likely. So, that is pretty much it for vertebrates around this time. Uh, Not not a whole lot kicking, it sounds like. No, they're sort of just getting their starts. Um, Which, though, though, they're just looking at all the invertebrates swimming around them. And just holding a fist and shaking it like, you'll see... One You'll all things. see. Yes. <laughs> um, so do we have uh, stuff for invertebrates? We sure do. Uh, so the Silurian is it. probably most famous uh, for a group of invertebrates called the Eurypterids. You have mentioned these before. I sure have, because the state fossil of New York is a Eurypterid called Eurypterus. And New York happens to be one of the best places to find uh, these Eurypterids or just Silurian ocean fossils in general. Uh, New York state is a great place for it. Um, And I've also mentioned, I don't remember when I mentioned this probably in our 600 million years in 60 slash 120 minutes. Um, But uh, Syracuse, you know, where Mike and I have spent a lot of time is known as the salt city. All of the salt from Syracuse is from the Silurian period. Really? It's all from then. And that's where, yep. wow. Yep. Wow. Okay. And so there's a very thin band, um, stretching from East to West in New York state that it basically stretches across most of the entire state. That is Silurian. 
in age. So um, if you live in the central part of New York, you can probably go find some Silurian age rocks fairly easily, um, particularly around Buffalo. That's where a lot of really, really good Eurypterid uh, specimens come from is around the Buffalo area. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, so these Eurypterids, uh, the, well, more colloquially, they're called sea scorpions. And so they're a group of chelicerates, which uh, include spiders and also things like horseshoe crabs and, and true scorpions. So they're related to, but sort of outside of those groups that we still have today. Uh, but they are, they were major predators in their environment. Some of them could get up to, you know, eight feet long, which at the time were probably some of the biggest things swimming around in the ocean. Uh, but they're also, especially as an invertebrate. Actually, let me ask you yeah. this. I, that seems, you know, reasonably large mm-hmm. for just anything, but especially for an invertebrate. Am I correct in thinking that, um, uh, vertebrate animals are, just going to be bigger and longer than invertebrates or am I mistaken? Generally. Yeah. Um, a lot of that comes down to, and we'll talk about this in more detail in a future period, because there was one period where terrestrial invertebrates got big. Um, but they're mostly limited by how much oxygen there is. They don't for the most part have a good breathing system or I guess efficient in a way that would allow them to become large. If that makes sense. Mm-hmm. I Like I said, I'll go more into detail when it becomes more relevant. I don't know as much about it gotcha. for, okay. for aquatic things, but for the terrestrial things, it's definitely how much oxygen there is available in the air. Nope. Totally makes sense. Um, but yeah, so these guys were, like I said, some of the major predators also, uh, especially some of the medium to smaller ones were major scavengers. You know, they show lots of adaptations for just sort of scuttling along the seafloor and likely just eating whatever they could find, whether it was, you know, another big Eurypterid that had died and fallen to the bottom or, you know, a trilobite that it happened to walk over top of. Uh, There was also a little bit of evidence of some of them coming up on land, which is interesting. That's actually relatively new research from like the past year or two. Um, cause we thought they had pretty much been a wholly aquatic, uh, group of animals, but no, there's some evidence. We found some like tracks of some in like on a beach, uh, which was really interesting. And so they might've been, uh, doing some more complex things than we had given them credit for in the past. But that is when you say complex, what are we, what are we talking about? Just, just more different things, more different lifestyles. Uh, okay. You know, some being predators, some being scavengers, some potentially still being aquatic. But if it can see something up on land that it wants to go get, it could just run up on land and grab it and eat it. Just more diversity, it sounds like. Yeah. Okay. Um, but yeah, speaking of trilobites, we have lots of everybody's favorite undersea Roombas uh, running around and doing their kind of thing. You know, doing, again, a lot of the variety of things that trilobites do if you can think of some kind of ecological niche trilobites did it at some point uh we'll have a whole episode about trilobites eventually but most of them are thought to have just sort of scuttled along the the seafloor uh eating things like algae eating pretty much whatever was small enough to fit in their their little mouths but there were some that were like actual predators that would hunt down other trilobites some were swimming instead of just sitting uh you know on the seafloor and so they were doing their thing. They weren't as diverse as they were in the Ordovician and they wouldn't really ever become that diverse again, but they were still around in a big part of the ecosystem at this time, Mm -hmm. as well as your very classic other paleozoic. So this larger chunk of time, sort of the, but before the big mass extinction at the end of the Permian, um, very classic ocean life at this time. So things like your crinoids, or sea lilies attached to the bottom had some like tentacles hanging in the water. They would just sort of filter feed little particles that would happen to flow into their tentacles. Things like brachiopods, basically doing what clams and other bivalves do today. Nautiloids were uh, very common at this time. That would be uh, relatives of squids and octopus, but with uh, a variety of different kind of shells. All of them were doing pretty great around this time. 
the oceans were really productive, lots of single-celled things in the oceans, able to do photosynthesis really well, which is effectively the ocean's version of, like, grass. Lots of things, or I, I should say leaves. Lots of things will eat leaves. Even, you know, horses and things that are adapted to eat grass, they'll still eat leaves. Because leaves are just easy to chew. And so there were lots of that kind of thing just everywhere in these shallow oceans. So things were generally doing pretty well. Reefs, mm -hmm. weirdly, were a little bit patchy throughout the period. Uh, there were some times where it's, you know, reef city, lots of reefs going on. And then other times where they're just kind of weirdly absent. That might be a sampling thing. So we, they might be there, but just not in the areas where we have good rocks from. That's all. That's always a thing in the fossil record. Uh, so just the unknown, right? But it's even given how much how little the rocks we have, we should probably be seeing more reefs in these weird patches. So there probably is something going on that we might allude to a little bit later in this podcast. Uh, but however, these reefs were not. Uh, really the, the kind that we have today. Mostly, made, even though they were still made out of corals, they weren't the same kinds of corals. Um, around this time is when we think that corals in general got their ability to do photosynthesis, which is super important. Corals, as, as we know them today, could not exist without... Uh, they have a little single-celled organism that lives inside them that does photosynthesis for them. And so the coral animal, which is basically like a little sea anem anemone, grabs food, breaks that down, and gives the food to the those nutrients to the single-celled thing. That does photosynthesis, and in return, gives food to the coral, and that's how they live. Uh, before this time, in the Middle Silurian, that wasn't a thing. Corals did not have the ability to do photosynthesis, or, and probably were not even, like, colorful, like we think of as corals today. Uh, so, corals really get this is probably the most important part of coral evolution in their history is their gaining of these photo symbionts as they're called. Could you, I mean, to bring things down for a second, could you make the case that right now is the most important part in coral history, considering that they're how endangered they are? Oh no. Corals have been way worse off than they are today. Like that's not to downplay really? how they're doing today. Cause they're not doing well. Uh, but yeah, no, there's for sure been times in coral history where they have been doing much worse than they are today. For wow, sure. Okay. Um, huh. Interesting. Yeah. So we may have to have a friend come talk about that, but another time. Yeah, for sure. Uh, but yeah, so these kind of corals were called, one. the two main groups were called tabulate corals. So they just sort of built the reef in a different way than modern corals do. Not super important. But the other one are called rugosin corals, which are uh, more commonly called horn corals, these were solitary. So instead of building sort of the big mound as a colony, they the animal itself was bigger and would build like a curved cone looking like a, like a cow horn or something shaped uh, thing that where the pointy end would be sitting down in the sediment and they would just sort of grow up and uh, still be living like a coral, but just by themselves, not part of a colony. Very, very common fossils. Uh, also doing some some reef stuff. We have some sponges, which there's not that many times in uh, Earth history where sponges are like a major part of reefs. They're always a part, but not like a major fundamental part. But this was one of those times. Uh, so there's a group always of... Always Robin, never Batman. Pretty much, yeah. Spo well, it's because sponges are very, very simple. It's like, they're like on the threshold where it's like, are you actually even an animal? <laughs> not quite sure. Um, right on that borderline. Right. It's like, are you an animal or are you a, like, just like colonial group of sing like single celled organisms? As far, you know, I've, I've never seen anybody like really question it, but man, they, they are the line <laughs> for being an animal. <laughs> um, but yeah, so there's a group of sponges called stromatoporoids. Excellent name. Um, and they also had these uh, photosymbionts similar to coral. So they had photosynthetic little bacteria things living in, in their cells, doing photosynthesis for them and uh, building reefs, just like we think of corals doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's been some 
more soft bodied things found in the fossil record. But the big one that I kept finding where it was like, oh, this is the, the time period for this was the first leeches. Which are gross. I hate leeches. Leech. I rem- yeah. I- have you ever had a leech on you? Uh, no, I have not. So I spent a good part of my youth running around in, in streams and ponds and stuff in like rural New York. And, uh, <laughs> oh boy. Yeah, no, leeches are horrible. <laughs> they are the worst. <laughs> um, I, I mean, do they, what, do they serve any kind of a good purpose? Yeah. I mean, they provide food for a lot of, th- everything will eat a leech. Um, they're very soft, very squishy and very easily digestible. And oftentimes they're full of somebody else's blood, which is also quite nutritious. Um, so yeah, I'll, they're very good food for a lot of things. Um, some of them are actually even predatory, not just parasitic, which is weird. Um, story for another time, but yeah, like so, story for another time, right? Right, but but it's like by this point, leeches were leeching it up; they're do- doing their thing. <laughs> and so that would have been if if I had made this episode a couple, like like two three months ago, this would be where it ended. But as I was doing more research for episode fifty nine about the Ordovician period right before this, I kept sort of seeing that extinction. You know, one of the big five mass extinctions referred to as the Ordovician Silurian extinction events. And that's not entirely uncommon. A lot of other mass extinctions are named for the period that they're like on the boundary of. It's like the extinction that killed the dinosaurs is often called the KPG. K for Cretaceous, P for Paleogene, because it's right on that boundary. Um, the end Permian mass extinction is often called the Permo-Triassic extinction. So at, at first, I didn't really think anything of it. I'm like, well, it's the end of the Ordovician, sure. But after I did a little more reading, I was like, I discovered that there were actually some extinctions in the Silurian that a minority of people actually sort of include in that and Ordovician extinction event. Which surprised the heck out of me, because I didn't I never knew that before. I, I'll tell you what, I certainly didn't either. <laughs> yeah, so there were three much smaller, not nearly as big, um, as any of the extinctions you've probably heard about. Um, but still like n- very noticeable extinction events that happened throughout the Silurian period that I just want to touch on really quickly here. So the first one it was called the Irovecian event. Irovecian event. All of these are like Swedish names. So all three of these are best known from like a single island in Sweden. So take that with a big grain of salt. Where it's like all the evidence I was able to find does suggest that this does represent a global thing that happened. But all the best evidence is all from a single place. So... Take that as you will. Grain of salt. Yeah. Yeah. So this first event happens roughly in the middle of the Silurian period. um, And it's widely considered an anoxic event. So when the ocean was depleted in oxygen for some reason. Um, This didn't really affect shallow reef environments for some reason. So this wasn't one of those times where it was patchy. But instead, it really, really hurt open water organisms really hard. Uh, Particularly. And how's that? Like, like, why did it affect one and not the other? Yeah. Uh, it could be anything from ocean circulation patterns. It could be, uh, you know, the, the shallow oceans, you know, just by nature of being shallow, could get just oxygen diffused into them by the atmosphere, by the air. Um, whereas, you know, deeper water can't do that because it's farther down. It has to diffuse farther down through the water. Uh, it was likely due to some strange ocean chemistry thing. I've seen a couple things proposed Nothing super solid as to why this happened, but the the chemistry suggests that this happened. Okay, that that's set, unfortunately a common we're, thing. We're pretty sure that it happened, but like not why quite sure is, why. Uh, yeah, unclear. Okay, so, um, but particularly, uh, the groups hit hard by this one were trilobites. You know, about half of them went extinct at this time. Conodonts, which are a group of vertebrate things that are very eel-like 
Um, they're like just on the cusp of like being jawed versus jawless. So sort of in that realm, very important because we use their fossils very often to tell time. They're very good uh, index fossils, but they lost up to like 80% of their diversity from this first event. And uh, another group called Graptolites, which are a group of like floating filter feeding organisms uh, that we don't really have anymore. They, there's nothing really good to compare them to, but um, they were also hit quite hard because they live out in the deep open ocean. So I did see one thing that said that this might have been tied to Milankovitch cycles, which are like Earth's orbital cycles, which are is weird. That seems like, I, every time I hear Milankovitch cycles, it seems like people are using it as an explanation for something that they can't explain otherwise. A little bit. Um, this one did actually look like we have, like, decent resolution on it. As good a resolution as you can get from over 400 million years ago. So it's like, okay. so the Milankovitch cycles is basically a, a, you know, cycle of Earth orbiting the sun that lasts a little under 40,000 years. And so Milankovitch cycles basically are a big part of a lot of the funky climate things that have been going on relatively recently in Earth history, like like the ice ages. People have used that to try to explain when the ice recedes and when it grows again in the recent ice ages. Um, but for this time, it seems to line up uh, uh, some of the like sort of pulses of this seem to sort of line up with some Milankovitch cycles. Others don't, so I don't know how reliable that is, but I saw it come up a couple times, so I wanted to mention it. Anywho. All right. The second of these three events is about six million years later. So we're in the latter half, latter third, probably of the Silurian period by this point, but is the mold or moldy event. Uh, another anoxic event. I did also see that this may not have actually been like an extinction thing. It maybe have just been a change in deposition, meaning that we're just not getting fossils. That can also happen in geology, and that's hard. It can be really hard to figure out is if this is actually an extinction, or if you're just not getting Goes deposition. Back to fossils. Right. Goes back there again. Right. So, uh, but this one is kind of attributed to sea level drop, so likely uh, a decrease in temperatures, meaning that some of the seawater would be locked up in ice and dropping sea levels. And the third, and last of the, the three, is the Lao event, about three million years later, and so only about four and a half million years before the end of the Silurian period. And this was a combination of probably like a little bit of sea level rise, so things had, had sort of been adjusting to the lowered sea levels, and then it rises again, which messes some things up, as well as some increased ocean mixing, which just messes with ocean chemistry, in a way that life doesn't tend to like, because life doesn't really like change. Um, and then the, following that, there was some weird ocean chemistry stuff. Again, not quite sure the precise mechanisms for it, but the, the chemistry says there was some funky stuff going on. And this last one tended to be wider reaching in terms of the groups that it impacted. So even things like your vertebrates got impacted a bit by this. Um, and just a general sort of downturn for life. And a big reason you can tell that is some fossils called stromatolites were weirdly quite common around this time. So stromatolites are layers of microbial mats. And the reason why those are pretty rare when other life is around is because those are very tasty. A, <laughs> a lot of things will eat that. So it's like, well, if these are growing, clearly there's not things around to eat it. So life must have just not been doing great right then if these stromatolites were able to grow. And that's part of how we know there was a mass extinction event? More or less. Like I said. Okay. Or like one of the many reasons, but yeah. Right. But that's just sort of a line of evidence to be like, mm, so, something funky is going on here. So these three, I think, are not the best studied. Like I said, they're best known from this one island in Sweden. So I'd like, I also don't know how recently these events have been reviewed or even like presented initially. 
they, I think they, they're a relatively recent thing. So hopefully we'll get some better information about them over the next handful of years. This whole time period seems like, uh, you ever read, um, To Kill a Mockingbird? I didn't. That was one that everybody I meet was like, like, you know, you, if you talk to them about what you read in English class in high school, everyone's like, right. oh yeah, definitely. I'm like, nah, not me. So when I, it has been over a decade at this point since I read it in my 10th grade English class, mm-hmm. shout out to Miss Shelley. Um, but like, and she warned us this, like the first half of the book was boring as all hell. And she said, but it sets up everything in the second half of the book. And I feel like this whole, um, this whole time period, the Silurian, like it's like, it doesn't seem like there's a whole lot happening. You know, there's a mm. kind of a mass extinction event that's not well studied and some things are going on to land, but we don't know too much about, like, it seems like it's a whole lot of, all right, we had to do the boring part. We had to eat our vegetables here. Right before we could get to the cool part afterwards. That's what, that's what this whole period seems like. It is the, you know, setting the stage for everything that's, you know, I assume is going to come next. Yeah. I think that's a really good way to put it because, uh, the next period life gets fun. The Devonian period, which comes after this is very cool. Uh, many, many things happen, but, uh, including, but not limited to, uh, actual big plants for the first time in life's history. Uh, actually, How big? I mean, like trees. Not like, you know, big trees, That's but, big. you know, tree-ish. Still. Yeah. Um, as well as vertebrates coming up on land. Uh, arthropods having a field day all over the place. Fish, in general, doing real, real well for the first time and being actually, like, the major significant part of their ecosystem. So, I mean, I'm, I'm spoiling, I'm spoiling. Uh, <laughs> for whenever we get around to doing the Devonian period. But yeah, you know, like I said, we always just kind of brushed over the Solarian period. And I'm like, well, there must have been a reason for that, right? And no, I don't think there was. The Solarian should be talked about more. <laughs> I agree. It's, it sounds like there's a lot of, there's a lot of fertile ground here for an, uh, an entrepreneurial young scientist to, uh, to go make some hay. So I, w- I would definitely agree with that. There's definitely room here for some more to happen. Absolutely. And who knows, maybe, you know, I always like to throw around, like if there's something that like we definitely should know, but don't, I'm like, well, maybe it's under Antarctica. <laughs> like, oh, we got to get through that ice, man. We're getting there. It's going to be easier and easier every year. It sure is. <laughs> <sighs> All right. Well, this has been episode 66 of I Wish You Were Dead, a podcast about things that used to be alive. My name is Mike, and that is Gavin. And next week, we uh, we have something special for everybody that has made it this far. But you'll have to wait until episode 67 in order to get there. Until then, have a great week, and we'll see you next Wednesday.